So firstly, thanks all for coming along to the talk. I'm glad you find this sort of thing interesting. Um, should we start off? Um, this is not the type of homebrew. We'll get it out of the way. It's sort of elephant in the room. Um, if anyone wants to talk about this after the show, I'm quite happy to do that because I do like talking about this sort of homebrew as well. Um, just to introduce what this Wii homebrew actually is, can I have a quick show of hands? Who owns an iOS device or an Android device, phone or tablet? Or okay, and can you leave your hand up if you've rooted your Android phone or if you've jailbroken your iOS device? Okay, pretty much everyone. That's what I thought. That's what we're doing with the Wii. We're taking the piece of hardware that we've purchased and we're modifying it so that we can do what we want with it, so we have more choices. <coughs> um, when you have a, a, a jailbroken iPhone, that means you can install applications that um, Apple hasn't sanctioned. When you have a, jail, uh, a rooted Android phone, you can remove bloatware that comes with your phone provider. When you have a modified Wii, same deal. You can sort of install whatever software you want on that Wii and run it, as long as it exists. Um, Okay, so there's two types of people who are interested in this sort of liberation of a console so you can run whatever you want. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the first one, um, but it is true that uh, Nintendo really doesn't like the homebrew scene because as soon as you can install your own um, software on a Wii, that means you can install software to allow you to run pirated software and so on and so forth. So there's a bit of a tension between Nintendo and the homebrew community because of this. Um, but we're focusing on the homebrew side. That's actually my brewery back at home in Melbourne. Um, this talk is about the Wii. Can I have a show of hands who owns a Wii in here? Yeah? Does anyone have the Homebrew channel installed on their Wii? Cool. That's a pretty good turnout. Yeah. Um, but this talks about the Wii, but there's also Homebrew for a whole bunch of other things as well. So I actually started with Nintendo DS. Um, someone at uni had a project they were working on, but I don't have a very, proficient, a very good proficiency with C, so I struggled with all of the memory registers and um, interprocessor communication. Uh, the Wii was a lot more basic. Um, it's sort of like developing for a regular PC. Um, and you'll probably find it much more comfortable. Okay. Um, we're going to have three different parts to the talk. I'm going to start off with some examples um, of what you can do on the Wii with Homebrew. Then we're going to have a brief history of uh, the Homebrew scene and how you go about modifying your Wii so you can run Homebrew on it. And then we'll discuss some issues with developing uh, software to run on the Wii itself. Um, so we'll start off with some examples. Um, in case you haven't realised, this is actually running on a Wii. I brought my Wii in and I'm quite thankful it's actually working on this projector down here. Um, so what I'll do is I'll try and reboot it and have a look at the homebrew channel and see what we like on <laughs> First thing you note is we have a different loader on the Wii than the typical bootloader. Um, so this one here allows you to short circuit straight to the homebrew area. It also allows you to uh, uh, revert back to a previous system if you do something that stuffs it up completely. Um, you can go back to a sort of stock install of the uh, Nintendo. Um, I actually had to jump straight in here because I don't have an IR sensor for this, except for the lights on the roof that seem to work okay. Um, and the Wii menu doesn't let you navigate around without an IR sensor. Um, so what we have in here is a couple of different pages of applications. What the Homebrew channel is doing is it's looking at the SD card in here and it's finding all of the applications in the particular folder structure and then throwing up their icons on the screen. Um, first type of application I'd like to talk about is uh, an emulator. So if this is the only thing that you install on your Wii that you've installed the Homebrew channel on, you probably won't be disappointed. Um, we got a lot of work out of this. Um, this is my girlfriend's Wii, not mine, and that's the only reason I was actually allowed to do this was because I promised she would be able to play Donkey Kong on it when she was done. Um, <laughs> so we've got an emulator. Um, also, if anyone works for Nintendo in here, I do actually own all these games on an original NES back home. <laughs> okay, so I've got an emulator, just typical Nintendo, uh, Super Nintendo. They have more emulators than you could poke a stick at. Atari 2600, Super Nintendo, <coughs> Nintendo um, Game Boy, a whole bunch of obscure consoles I've never actually heard of before. Um, this is a really good example because you can see the guy who's worked on the GUI here, it's very Nintendo Wii-ish, looks a lot like that. Um, this library is actually available for you. He's taken this GUI library and made it available for other people to use software like this as well. Um, I'll discuss that later. So, like I said, that's the first thing you're probably going to do is download an emulator and start playing all those cool games. Um, another type of thing you might want to do is something like a media center. So you have this device with a processor inside it and a graphics chip, and it's plugged into your TV, and all the kids in the house and all your parents know how to get to the Wii on the TV. It's quite easy to do, so why wouldn't you want to have a whole bunch of media stuff sitting on there to use? Excuse me. So, what we have here? Uh, movies, so you can plug in a USB hard drive here, browse through all the movies on there, or your legally purchased movies from online. Um, 
You'll just have to downscale them, though, because the Wii's actually not capable of um, decoding... <laughs> we almost lost another laptop there. <laughs> um, the Wii's not capable of decoding HD video, so you'd have to run it through some sort of processor first. Um, we have audio, so you can have, again, all your legally purchased music on here. Um, I've got the slideshow on here. I'm not sure where the infrared source is, so I've got my little kitten over here. Um, my friend's mum absolutely loves slideshows on the TV. Like, whenever she has a party, she'll get a USB disc and put it into the TV. If the TV doesn't support slideshows, she's stuck. So it'd be nice <laughs> if she had a, a Wii to put in there. That's my little Arthur man. Back home. We also have uh, web browsing, uh, YouTube, Lip TV, those sort of things. <laughs> Whoops, I accidentally quit the Wii program. Um, so you can watch all the OSDCs of years gone by. And it has a DVD player in there as well, so we'll read the DVDs. But I found, realistically, it probably bails on about half of them, so I'm not quite sure about the quality of the DVD player inside there. Um, okay. So we've got emulators, we've got media centers. Um, the next category would probably be games that have been ported from computer to here. So games that have already been developed and have a code base ready. So this is a used to be an old DOS game, Tyrion, that I've played for quite a while. Um, someone ported it in SDL in, for typical PCs. Um, and then someone took that port and brought it across to the Wii. So it's a pretty faithful port. Um, I don't know if anyone's actually played it before or not, but... Um, exactly the same as it was back in DOS, exactly the same as it is on Windows. The um, person who did the porting, all they really needed to do was uh, change, I suppose, the input controls, and that would be about it. These artifacts you're seeing, they don't normally appear. It's something to do with a projector here, so it's actually even more faithful than we're seeing on this projector. If I had to get back with that pointing again. Okay. Now, the last type of one that I'll go through is um, homebrew that has been developed <coughs> specifically for the Wii. So someone's come up and gone, I have an idea. I like the hardware inside the Wii. I like the peripherals that are plugged into it. I'm going to develop an application that works just for the Wii. So uh, an example you might have would be this guy here, that other person. He's actually got quite a few different PS3 and um, uh, Wii homebrew games, specifically just for these consoles. It's not something that he's done for anything else. Um, and this is sort of a typical zombie shooting game. Can't move because I don't have the other part of the controller in there. Um, you can see you can get relatively good quality, a bit of fun graphics out of it. Um, but it is a little bit disappointing about the quality of most of these games that are on here. I'm going to have to physically reset the Wii because I can't point. Um, that's not such a bad thing that the quality is bad. It depends what angle you look at it. If you're a developer, it's a good thing because if you develop something cool for the Wii, people will like it. It will stand out um, amongst the other stuff that maybe isn't so good. If you're not a developer and you're just expecting to play a whole bunch of really cool, fun games, you're probably not going to find a bunch of really high-quality homebrew games that people have made. Not saying they don't exist, but not as many as you would hope. Okay, so that's a brief example of uh, the stuff you can do. This is the application I wrote just to give my presentation. You need to give two eyes in something if you're making it for the Wii, otherwise it's not real Wii homebrew. Um, <laughs> let's see if it picks up where we left off. Okay, so that ran pretty smoothly, I think. Um, it was seg folding this morning when I was trying it at the hostel, so I'm glad that most of those things worked okay. Um, so the second part, before we go into the development, just a brief history of um, how they go about modding the Wii's in the first place. Um, what you'll find is, in order to run arbitrary code on the Wii, you need to first find vulnerabilities that you can exploit, so you can overflow buffers and start executing arbitrary code. Um, but the problem is, all of the disks inside the Wii are actually encrypted, and the encryption key is stored inside memory somewhere inside the Wii, um, that you don't normally have access to. So I don't actually understand all the specifics of it, but there's a really good uh, detailed documentation of uh, the story here. Uh, what they did was they managed to physically trick the Wii into taking the piece of memory which stored the encryption key, putting it into another piece of memory that they could access, and then soldering on a serial port to the computer and then sending the keys across to their computer, or something like that. But uh, Once again, I don't fully understand it, but it's a, it's a really good... Uh, the guy who actually did this, uh, he has an interview up there. So once you find the, um, these vulnerabilities, you can start decrypting game disks, analyzing them, and looking for vulnerabilities that you can exploit. And there's a lot of exploits. It's, it's the same paradigm as the jailbreaking an iPhone. So if someone finds an exploit, Apple patches it. Someone finds an exploit, Apple patches it. Same thing here with Nintendo. Um, Zelda Twilight Princess, Super Smash Bros. Brawl. I use the Indiana Jones Lego Adventure one. Um, and then there's some operating system ones too. So Bandit Bomb is actually an exploit inside the operating system itself. And the newest one on the top right corner here, Letter Bomb, that's another vulnerability inside the operating system that they've managed to exploit. So you don't need to have that game. I actually just went down to the local video store, borrowed that game, 
It was the only Wii game that actually looked like it had been used before. Um, so obviously I'm not the only person who's... Because I definitely didn't get it for the gameplay, because it's a horrible game. <laughs> it's a little bit of fun. You download your, your, exploit, your, your specially crafted save file and you put it on the disc. And then you start following these secret instructions in the game. We have to go talk to this specific guy, and then he, when he says something, all of a sudden a big black screen comes up and it starts executing this code, and then it installs a homebrew loader. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it's a little bit like a uh, like a James Bond film or something like that in that sense. Um, probably put aside about I mean, an hour and around, an hour and a half, because what, what it's doing is it's actually backing up the previous state of the system onto the SD card. So it's a little bit slow, but put aside about an hour, an hour and a half, um, and it's relatively smooth in that sense. Um, so this website, if you want to install Homebrew on your Wii, this is the current one for the most recent uh, system menu, which most people would probably have on their Wii. Um, if you go there, it'll give you instructions on how to download the specially crafted files, put it on the SD card, um, and then install Homebrew on your Wii. Okay? Uh, I'm not responsible if your Wii gets turned into a brick. There is some people find that when they do something to their Wii like this, uh, in some edge case, the Wii breaks and becomes completely useful for anything except for holding open doors. Um, but the anecdotes online is it doesn't seem like it happens as often with, for instance, mobile phones. And, and the other anecdote is it seems like it's easier for Nintendo or for the phone manufacturer to just fix the problem rather than argue with you about whether you should have done what you have or haven't done. Um, but as long as you're aware, there are minor risks and it's a little bit of fun trying to convince your girlfriend to mutilate her Wii in the hope that um, all her saved files for Mario Kart are on there. She doesn't want to lose. Same deal, she's asking me, is it legal? I'm not sure if there's been a tested precedent. Does anyone know definitively this question, the answer to this question? It's hardware modding is illegal at the moment. Software modding in the grey area is still. Okay, so that's a good point actually. What I'll mention is in the old days you used to have to, of course, physically install a mod chip inside the hardware, you go down to your local swap meet and pay someone $20. Now um, it's all software, so you don't have to have anyone actually touch inside your Wii. Um, that grey area, yeah, <laughs> that sounded a little bit strange. <laughs> uh, can I get that stricken from the record? On the one hand, you do own the Wii, what you do with the privacy you own home is one thing. On the other hand, you... you that sounds a little weird as well. <laughs> you may be in breach of some sort of contract with the... Manufacturer. Yeah, so that's what it comes down so to. It's not a crime. You, you probably be. do void your warranty mm -hmm. if you do this. Um, but, for instance, there was a, the recent case with, I think, Geohoot was his name, with the PlayStation 3. He found out how to jailbreak the PlayStation 3. Sony took into court for a violation of the end user license agreement for the PlayStation network. But that didn't actually get tested in court because they settled before it got resolved. So, pretty sure it's okay. Um, and they only even bothered to do that because he was telling people about it. Yeah. If you do, again, if you do it for privacy of your own home, then you know. Yeah. So these people are telling people about it, of course, but I'm a person, well, I personally am as well, but you guys, if you're doing it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, and just briefly before we get onto the development, um, there is a bit of a history that once again, Homebrew guys were trying to be nice by saying, what well, we're going to actually close source most of the stuff we do so that you can't have a look at the exploits that we do. And that was a gesture of good faith towards Nintendo saying, look, don't attack us, we're not interested in piracy, we're trying to prevent pirates from getting their hands on our code, and we're trying to prevent piracy on the Wii. Um, didn't work at all, Nintendo wouldn't have a bar of it, and there's some good stories online about the responses that Nintendo have posted to the people who've worked on this and vice versa. I won't go into too much detail about that though. Um, so developing, um, developers conference obviously. If anyone here is interested in developing on the Wii, I strongly encourage it. Um, first thing is we need a tool chain to develop with. So there's a thing called DevKit Pro. DevKit Pro is a port of the GNU compiler collection and a bunch of tools to deal with uh, development as well. Um, DevKit Pro exists for I mean, you actually use DevKit PowerPC for the Wii. There's DevKit ARM for the Nintendo DS. There's also a DevKit for um, PSP and some other obscure console that I've never heard of before. Um, but I did look at a picture of it and it looked quite boring. Um, so you download that. Again, probably wouldn't take you more than half an hour to get this all set up. The instructions are quite good. Um, we were just discussing up the back corner before. A couple of years ago it wasn't actually very stable, but uh, personally I haven't had any issues with it at all. Installing new versions and updating all seems to be working quite smoothly. Um, set up your dev development environment. Again, quite easy to follow the instructions online, so I'm not going to detail every little thing here. Um, I use Eclipse, um, and essentially it comes down to just take one of the examples that comes with DevKit Pro. There's a whole bunch of examples for graphics, for file system access, for Wi-Fi access, for a whole bunch of different things. Copy the folder you want as a template, paste it, and then start coding away on the C or C++. 
Um, I'm, I'm not very good with make files either. Um, I'm happy to admit that, but um, it's quite easy to just, as you need to add dependencies, put them in the make file, and then everything runs quite smoothly. Um, when you're developing, in, uh, so you've got your environment set up, you've got it compiling, um, you want to be able to run it somehow to make sure that it does what you expect. And you can actually load it up onto the Wii every time you want to run it, but that gets a little bit tedious, so we install an emulator on our computers. This is my inception moment where this is me emulating this talk um, as I was developing it for this presentation. Um, this emulator, Dolphin, uh, Dolphin emulator, I'm pretty sure it's the only Wii emulator. Um, it's a bit harder, there's a bit more effort involved in developing a Wii emulator than something like a Super Nintendo, which might have less hardware to emulate. Most of the times when you find a bug in the emulator, that's actually a real bug in the system and vice versa. But there are some times where it will work on the emulator, but it won't work on the system in very sort of weird ways. Um, that's a little bit of fun to track down. Um, and then so you've got your development environment set up, you've got it hooked up to the emulator, your emulator can run the binaries that you've compiled, um, you can start coding. So what I'll have a quick look at is just a quick uh, whirlwind tour of some of the libraries that are available for you to use. Um, the guys from DevKit Pro, Pro have ported a bunch of these sort of really basic uh, libraries for you to use, so for fonts, for images, for XML processing, for zipping and things like that. Um, the zipping one's a bit weird, but it's good if you want to do anything across the network, of course. Um, other people have ported other libraries too. Um, sorry, if anyone wanted that link, that was you can just search port libs and it's pretty much the first hit on Google. Um, some other libraries that people have come out with is uh, SDL, so if anyone's not familiar with it, it's a simple direct media layer, I think that's what it's for. Um, it's pretty much a graphics and an input sort of toolkit uh, library that abstracts away a whole bunch of stuff to do with graphics <coughs> and input. And that's great for me because this is actually written in SDL, and SDL's on ported to several different platforms. This is the, the Wii code to set up the display. So at least two pages of this sort of frame buffer set up and everything. Uh, this is the SDL code to set up the display. It's four lines. It's much easier. It's probably less buggy. And I don't really like copying and pasting code that I don't understand. So it's, it's much nicer to do something like this. There are other graphics libraries as well that people have written to abstract this sort of thing away from me. Box2D and Bullet are two quite um, heavy-duty uh, physics libraries, so if you want to do anything uh, in that sort of domain, I'm looking at maybe building a racing game or something like that, and Box2D is quite good. Um, collision detection and all of that sort of stuff that you might need. A bunch of other libraries as well. Um, I'll have a link to Webrew at the end, but Webrew is a really good wiki that has a whole bunch of this sort of information to look at. Um, then there's libraries that, sorry, these libraries were specifically libraries that existed on, uh, for regular development on PCs, and then have been ported to the Wii. Then there's libraries just for the Wii. So if you want to access information about the Miis, which are the little avatars on the Wii that you make to look like yourself, you can load them up with this library. Um, LibWii GUI. This is, as I mentioned before, with that um, Super Nintendo emulator that looked a lot like the uh, the, the typical Wii interface. Um, he's brought that across to its own little library. Um, LibWii Sprite is even lower level. Sprites on the screen, 2D pictures moving around if you need to. And again, a bunch of other libraries. Um, GX is, again, more low-level graphics. It's actually how you sort of the equivalent of OpenGL on a PC. It's the, um, the library that you use to access the graphics hardware on the Wii. Um, it's very similar to OpenGL. So this is the GX code for translating and then drawing a triangle. And this is a GL code, OpenGL code for translating and drawing a triangle. So pretty similar. It's a little bit more verbose. You need to specify a few more parameters and be a little bit more careful. Um, but by and large, it's quite similar. And someone's actually written a library called GL to GX, so you can write your code in OpenGL, and then it will um, actually execute the <coughs> equivalent GX command. But I'm not sure how well that's supported. A um, couple of issues you'll come across when you're developing um, on a console like this is uh, your debugging environment. So USB Gecko, this is a piece of hardware that goes in the GameCube memory card slot at the back of the Wii, um, and allows you to, and then it connects to a USB cable, so you can actually debug over the wire um, on your computer. But they've been discontinued, so it's actually quite hard to get a hands on that. I found one on eBay before I um, before I came up here, so I don't actually have one, but I'm probably going to get one when I go back home. Another alternative is GDB over Wi-Fi, so you can um, uh, compile in the GDB stub into your code, send it across to the Wii, and then you can debug remotely from your PC. Um, but again, the person who came up with this, it was a few years ago, and it doesn't look like it has a lot of support, and it seems quite difficult. Um, it would be nice to, for me to have a proper play with it and see how it goes. But I just stuck to the typical of printf and binary search. So put a printf in the middle of the code. If you hit the printf, you didn't have a bug. Um, and the bug's in the second half of your code. 
So that actually will only work on the emulator, though. So if you imagine if you're doing a printf on the console, you could do an f printf to a file if you really wanted to. You could printf perhaps to a virtual console on the screen, but then there's a whole bunch of issues if there's bugs in that. So when I'm actually on the console, I just use the same thing, but an exit command. If it exits successfully, there wasn't a bug. If it doesn't exit successfully, you get all hell break loose on your screen like this. Um, this is the, sort of the equivalent of the blue screen of debt. Um, but it's useful because we do get a stack dump up here. So these are the memory addresses of where the error caused, uh, occurred. And you can use the address to line tool on your, uh, against your debug binary to find out the specific location in your binary, in your code, uh, in your source code where the bug occurred. And you can do that for all of these elements in the stack trace. So it's a little bit tedious, but that's sort of a last resort. Um, that brings me to my last tool, which you really need if you're developing for a Wii. Um, the only way to escape from this screen is to physically reset the Wii. So I have a, um, a universal remote that I use, so while I'm sitting down on my chair, <laughs> I can uh, reset the Wii without having to get up off my bum. Okay, so these are the two resources you really want to look at if you're going. Again, I'm not going to, oh, I didn't want to go into extreme detail because there's so much information on there and it's not very good me just bombarding you with it. Wii Brew is um, obviously specifically for the Wii, um, and it's a huge wiki. There's so much information, some technical, some not technical, about lists of games that are there, lists of libraries that are available. Um, some specific uh, technical details about file formats and executable file formats and things like that. Um, and DevKit Pro, as I mentioned, there's actually a bunch of forums on there. So this is the you know, the guys who came up with the GNU um, compiler collection and some associated libraries as well. So there's a bunch of forums on there and some guys who know a real lot about this sort of stuff floating around. Um, and that's actually the end of my talk because I speak much faster than I plan to every single time. Thanks. <laughs> Any, question, uh, any questions? Hey, hey is there a, I don't know much about the Wii hardware. Is there a fan in the Wii? Is it kind of live power? Uh, is there a fan? fan? Yeah, I'm just thinking as a, as a live power general purpose device, is it, is it good? Or? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't really comment on that. I'm not too sure about the hardware. If you, if you had a GameCube, it's essentially a GameCube with a couple of extra bits tacked on the side. Um, does anyone want to comment on that? I'm not sure. It does have a small fan. Okay. There was a Linux port at one point, but I don't think it went anywhere. No, it still does exist, and I think you can still install it, but again, like you said, I don't think anyone's actively working on it. Um, you can pick them up quite cheap. Uh, yeah. Reset. Even brand new, they're quite cheap, of course, yeah, so yeah. Um, let alone second hand. <laughs> um, if you're going to pick one up, and you do want to use it for, for like a media center or something like that, Get one that's at least two years old, because uh, two years ago Nintendo changed the DVD drive and they, in they installed a hardware switch, so you physically couldn't play DVDs, videos on it, no matter what homebrew you had installed. I don't know why, but it's something to do with, well, they'll probably argue it's to do with playing backup games, but yeah, so anything older than two years should be fine if you want to watch DVDs on your Wii. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much.